This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Did you hear what the man said? Since 1966, that is stability and longevity, my friends. And once again, we are humbled that you decided to tune in to the Farm Monitor. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. Yes, 53 years and still going strong. And once again, we have a great show for you. Coming up, a Farm Bureau expert breaks down the Dairy Revenue Protection Program and explains why more producers should jump on board. Also on the show, U.S. Secretary of Ag Sonny Perdue weighs in on African swine fever and what USDA is doing to keep the disease from entering the states. Plus, break out those breath mints. We're getting you ready for onion season with a couple of recipes that are sure to please, including Marsh's always popular French onion soup. Stick around. All this and more starts right now on the Farm Monitor. With more and more families moving away from the farm, programs like Ag in the Classroom is now more important than ever. Damon Jones tells you how one elementary school in Milton celebrated National Ag Day with a little food, fun, and compost stew. When thinking about agricultural communities around the state, the metro Atlanta area isn't the first place that comes to mind. And that's exactly why it's so vital to educate students like these out in Milton about agriculture and its importance to their everyday lives. I think that it's a wonderful program to incorporate in classrooms every day, whether it's a math, um, lesson or social studies, we have an Ag in the Classroom program and it's necessary in the classrooms. And the kids? They didn't seem to mind as they were treated to plenty of food and fun, snacking on gummy worms, pretzels, and dried fruits while listening to entertaining books like Compost Stew. It's an atmosphere that really reflects the message trying to be sent. The Ag is fun um, and it's approachable and it's something that we all have a hand in, um, no matter you know, young, old, tall or small, we're all here pushing the same message and that agriculture is something that's needed and is still alive and thriving. The EPA was also a partner for this event as they look to spread some awareness on an often overlooked aspect of the ag industry. Most everyone correlates the importance of agriculture to food and fiber production, but what may not come to mind immediately is how important agriculture is to protecting our environment. National Ag Day is an opportunity where we can draw attention to the role of agriculture in protecting human health and the environment. Every day, the farmer and the EPA are working together to preserve the environment for future generations in a partnership that is always good to highlight. We know that farmers and the agricultural community care deeply about the environment, and this event is one way we can teach the children the relationship between agricultural production and environmental protection. It's our hope that the children gain an appreciation for agriculture and also walk away with a better understanding that agriculture is a key partner to protecting and preserving our environment. It's just another aspect of the ag industry that has many more career opportunities than students might realize. Agriculture isn't just growing. Agriculture is so much more. Um, my career is in ag and I'm an advocate and I want to teach the other kids that careers in agriculture can go from media to marketing to accounting to being an advocate and the always important being a grower. And it's not just a treat for the kids as these volunteers take great pride in educating the future of America about ag and its many benefits. Speaking to the children is my favorite part. The students are a huge part of our programming. Um, they help, we thrive off them. So just teaching them how, how to grow a seed and how important that is to see their eyes light up every time they see that they're empowered to grow their own food or that they're empowered to walk up to a farmer and get to know him or her, that's very important to us and it's, it's just very heartwarming. Reporting from Milton, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. In the meantime, as the dairy industry continues to battle low commodity prices, a number of questions are being raised about the Revenue Protection Program. It's a topic recently discussed at a special informational session hosted by Georgia Farm Bureau. Eric Swanson of American Farm Bureau Insurance explains the many benefits of the program. One of the unique pieces of the product is that it gives the flexibility, as I mentioned before, on them to be able to customize their coverage. Uh, one thing that's unique to this product compared to others that have come previously to this on the risk management side for dairy producers is that it does allow 
align closer to with how producers nationally are selling their milk. One of the biggest benefits to the product is having the ability to customize their coverage level and being able to at the same time set a, a price floor for their operation on the milk that they're producing. The grocery chain Kroger is now committed to dairy farmers. In fact, they recently kicked off the Milk Makes Amazing campaign at a Kroger location in Alpharetta, Georgia. Now when guests do their weekly shopping, they'll be able to see Georgia-grown milk and dairy products showcased through in-store and digital advertising. Initiated by the Agriculture Commodity Commission for Milk, the partnership with Kroger aims to educate consumers about the benefits and versatility of milk and dairy foods. We've got high hopes that we can put our positive message about milk in front of a lot of potential uh, uh, consumers that maybe are not drinking milk at this time. Uh, it also gives us, as dairy farmers in Georgia, an opportunity to put out a message that's positive for milk, but at the same time giving consumers education about uh, the other beverage choices they have and why milk should be their number one health drink. The Georgia beef industry is the sixth largest commodity in the state, contributing more than two billion dollars to the state's economy and to educate people on the fact as well as show other aspects of the beef industry. The Georgia Beef Board decided to create a children's book called Can Do Cow Kids. John Holcomb explains. The more that you read, the more things you will know. The more you learn, the more places you'll go. Wise words from Dr. Seuss that couldn't be truer. And realizing just how true those words can be and how impactful they are to a kid's life, the Georgia Beef Board decided to make a children's book to educate and inspire kids about the beef industry. And what better way to debut it than on Ag Literacy Day in the state of Georgia, where the book was read all over the state, even by Georgia's own governor. We felt like there was a need for a children's book that was industry accurate to the beef industry and um, something that could be used in a classroom but also would be a household favorite for kids to enjoy. When the process started, the search was on for an author and they ended up coming up on a perfect fit, Amanda Radke, someone that has previously written a children's book and actually lives on a working cattle ranch with her husband and kids. This book was inspired by my three can do cow kids in our life on our cattle farm in South Dakota. And so what I want other kids to do is to be able to see themselves in the main characters in Cody and Cassidy and that they have this ambition to grow up and become great things. And they feel empowered to do these things because they are can do cow kids that know if they work hard and dream big, they can achieve anything. And of course, a good children's book has to have a good illustrator to make the pages come to life. And what better choice than Michelle Weber, an artist and cattle producer herself, that has a passion to share farm life on canvas. My inspiration behind all the children's books that I've illustrated really is just the heart and soul behind ranch life and growing up on a ranch. Um, it, there's just so many extraordinary events that are just everyday life for us. Um, we get to see the beginning of life um, all, a whole season of it and for my kids to grow up and see that and um, experience all those real true life experiences um, is truly extraordinary and so I'm passionate about putting that on canvas and sharing it with the world. The main purpose of the book, you guessed it, is to educate. Educate on how beef gets to the dinner plate but also all the other aspects of the beef industry. This book is really important for our industry because it gives kids such a good opportunity to learn about the beef industry in Georgia, about the roles on a farm, day-to-day -day operations, and plus all the different jobs that are needed on a beef cattle operation, from a veterinarian to a conservationist to a nutritionist. All those roles are critical on a farm. According to the USDA, there's 57,000 plus jobs in agriculture available to college students. Uh, each and every year and only 33,000 of those jobs are filled and these are amazing careers in science and technology and uh, research, education, communications and so I want every kid that reads this book to know hey I can be a part of food production I can pursue my passions and my talents and there's a place for me in agriculture. Reporting in Atlanta for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. John, thank you so much. Well, when we come back, we are counting down to the big day. The day of the onion, that is. Meals from the field. It's coming up next.
buy hundreds of thousands of pounds of cottonseed oil to run the Café de Mont. We've had some guys come over and try to dethrone cottonseed oil, but it, it hasn't worked. Café du Monde was established in 1862 at this location in the New Orleans French Market. When I came to work here 32 years ago, we were using cottonseed oil to fry our beignets. Hubert Fernandez bought, bought the Café du Monde in 1942. They were cooking in cottonseed oil at that time. He didn't change a thing. recipes have been passed down from one generation to the next. We are cooking so many beignets that the oil, all the oil goes out absorbed on the beignet. We're continuously adding oil to our fryer. We don't throw any oil away. When you're in a food business, the most important thing you have is the quality of your product. That's what keeps your customers coming back. Don't even entertain the thought when somebody comes knocking at our doors asking us to use a different kind of oil to cook our beignets in. Now that's how important cottonseed is to our business. It's just, you know, part of the recipe. To the cotton farmers out there, I'd like to thank you for continuing to provide us with the, with the oil that we need to deliver our product to our customers. Thank you very much. All right, mark the date on your calendar. April 22nd, 2019. That is shipping date and packing date, whatever you want to call it, for the world famous Vidalia Onion. Always a big time here in Georgia. And to prepare you for that big day, we are doing recipes this month using onions. Obviously, we're not using Vidalia onions because they are not available yet, but we kind of want to prepare you for that. Also, if you're looking for some recipes for Easter Sunday or Easter weekend when the family's here, so, as always, I am joined by my good friend and partner in crime, Marsha Crowley. Good, good to, to see you, you Ray. Again. Yes. Happy spring. Happy spring to you as well. Uh, and again, uh, what can you say about the Vidalia onion that hasn't already been they're said? So, they're, just, they're just good. They are. But they're so, just good. So are yellow onions, if you if cooked right, and you have come up with some recipes today Hope that so. we think folks are going to like. So. And you can use Vidalia onions in these recipes as oh, well. Absolutely. Too, so. In fact, it might, in some of these, it might be even a little better. All right, we're, first thing we're doing is French onion soup, which is one of my favorites. Mm, very nice. So easy. So we've got already sauteed in here um, four cups of thinly sliced onion, um, a half a cup of butter, which is a stick, and two tablespoons of olive oil. You put the olive oil in there because you don't want the butter to burn. Okay. All right, that's sauteing. And you want to add to that um, five cups. Let's see if I can do this without spilling it. Yeah, last month you last month uh, I had a little accident. Little accident. All right, this is five cups of low sodium. I was going to say low broth. sodium because one thing about onion soup, sometimes when you get it at restaurants, it has a tendency to be high you sodium. You can always add salt, sure. you know, and get a decent brand of beef broth. Mm -hmm. You know, don't get the rot gut. Right. Okay. All right, we'll saute that. You're going to add to that a quarter of a cup of sherry, uh, dry sherry. Don't buy cooking sherry because it's got salt in it too. Okay. It's a regular stuff. Or you could use white wine. I would like to tell you, you could leave it out, but it's going to make a huge difference <laughs> if you do. And then we're going to add to that salt, pepper, and a little bit of thyme. And you're going to let that simmer for 
about 20 minutes. That's, that's simple. That's simple. Then you're going to dish it in a bowl and you're going to put a toasted uh, French uh, slice of French onion, uh, French onion, onion, uh, French bread on top, melt with provolone cheese, put it under the broiler, for, uh, but watch it very closely. Okay. That's all that there is to it. And you can make this, you could make this the day ahead. Perfect. Okay, let's turn that and off. It chills well and reheats. It, to it, perfect. Okay. Um, Okay, the next thing is an onion jam, Ooh. which is different. And this is four cups of finely chopped onion. And I did these in the food processor. You don't have to do that. Okay. So I've sauteed that. You caramelize it actually for like 20 minutes, which means all the sugar comes out. So with Vidalia onions, it would be great. Mm -hmm. You're gonna add to that four slices of chopped bacon. And I sauteed the onion in the bacon grease too. Okay. Okay, you're going to add to that um, a tablespoon of balsamic vinegar. And all those instructions obviously will be, will in be your on recipes there. Oh, yeah. as well. And a teaspoon of uh, sugar. And you just stir all that up and you would serve this really just about any on anything. Um, I've put it over a block of cream cheese with crackers. It would be good on a burger. It would be good on a sandwich. Okay. Um, and that will, that will uh, set up in your refrigerator for about a week. Okay. Okay, the last thing, and I'm not going to show anybody how to make a grilled cheese sandwich <laughs> because I think in the South you know how to do that. But you get some good bread. What was okay. it? This is called country bread, buttermilk country mm -hmm. bread. And you're going to put mayonnaise on both sides. Then you're going to use Havarti cheese. Mm -hmm. What's which, it called? Havarti. Havarti which cheese. I like because it's very creamy and it melts very well. Okay. Okay, and you're going to add to that tomatoes. I got to be honest, I've never had onions on a grilled cheese. That's good. I'm about to, though. Know. You're about to. About and to. then I sauteed these onions just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, since they're not Vidalia onions, I needed them to be a little sweeter. Okay. And then a little basil. You can find most of this stuff in your garden later on in the summer, and you're just going to simply grill it. Right. It is so good. And it is very, very good. Here is the final product for all this. This, of course, here is the sandwich. Look at that. That is so, so good. That is you so could add good. bacon to that if you, you wanted. Bacon to that. Um, and then over here, we've got the uh, little cream cheese. Uh, is that cream? That's cream cheese, I cream guess. Cream cheese with um, onion jam. With the onion jam on there. Little uh, Triscuit, what are those? Triscuits cr mm -hmm. crack crackers, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. And then everybody's favorite the good French old fashioned soup. French onion soup. Look at that. That is phenomenal. And you could probably freeze that minus the French bread slice and the yeah, cheese you, you could want, probably that would get really get soggy, a little soggy yeah. and stuff like that and my hands are a little greasy so i apologize and of course folks you can find all these recipes by locking on to farm-monitor.com again uh everything is there for you uh, is in there for you uh with great detail marcia takes a lot of uh pride and joy in sending us those recipes every single month so i am looking forward to digging in so we are going to let them go good to see you good as see always you. and as always we will see you again next month When we come back, a look ahead towards the month of October and the man who we now know will represent Georgia in hopes of being named the Southeastern Farmer of the Year. Hello, I'm Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue. And today I'd like to talk to you about something that threatens our pork industry, a devastating disease called African swine fever that is spreading around the world right now and affects both domestic and wild pigs. To be clear, it does not affect people, nor is it a food safety issue. Most importantly, African swine fever has never been detected in the United States. However, it is a very real threat. In 2017, Pork producers marketed over 120 million hogs valued at more than $20 billion. They provided about 25 billion pounds of meat to consumers worldwide. Additionally, the U.S. pork industry supports more than half a million jobs in the United States, the majority of those in rural areas. We know what's at stake, and we're determined to keep African swine fever out of the United States. We're being very proactive in our safeguarding efforts, but we cannot do it alone. 
Within the U.S., we're working with many partners, including states, veterinarians, and industry organizations to raise awareness of this devastating disease and how it spreads. Come here, Doc. We want everyone who comes into contact with pigs, from the large farm owner to owners of a single teacup pig, and even international travelers and petting zoo visitors to understand how easily this disease can spread and the importance of keeping our U.S. pigs free from this disease. We're doing our part at USDA to help prevent this by restricting imports of pork and pork products from affected countries and also by working to raise awareness about the signs and symptoms of African swine fever and how people can report sick pigs. We're also working with U.S. Customs and Border Protection to increase screening of passengers and baggage coming into the U.S. from affected areas as international travelers may unknowingly carry the disease back into the United States on their clothing or shoes. Here at USDA, we're prepared to respond if this disease does get to the United States. But we're hoping that with your help, we can prevent it from getting here in the first place. For more information about African swine fever and the work USDA is doing, please visit www.aphis.usda.gov. Thank you for all you're doing in your part to do right and feed everyone. Well, finally this week, family man, state representative, and now 2019 Georgia Farmer of the Year. It's a title that Crawford County's Robert Dickey takes great pride in, especially since farming has been the family business since 1897. He was recently honored during a special ceremony in downtown Atlanta, which was documented by the University of Georgia. This year, it's my honor to present the Georgia Farmer of the Year to State Representative Robert Dickey. Since returning to the family farm in the late 70s, Robert has diversified and grown the family's peach farming and timber enterprises through modernization, increased direct sales, adoption of best management conservation practices, and cooperative marketing. They have also focused on protecting the environment and improving water conservation. Dickey Farms markets 90% of their crop through wholesale channels, with the remaining 10% marketed through retail channels through their packing shed and mail order business developed by his wife, Cindy. With the popularity of the Georgia Grown Program, the packing shed has become an agritourism destination for strawberries, peaches, and other Georgia produce, as well as their popular ice cream. Over the years, Robert and Cindy have raised two children while developing and expanding the family farming enterprise. Truly a multi-generational farm, Robert's 91-year-old father, Mr. Bob, is still actively involved at the farm, providing guidance and checking on the orchards daily. I hope you all will please honor me in congratulating State Representative Robert Dickey for the 2019 Georgia Farmer of the Year. Yes, huge congratulations to Representative Dickey. And as for you, our faithful viewers, thank you for watching. We're out of time. Take care, everybody. We'll see you back right here next week on The Farm Monitor. Be safe.